40-year-old Anna Knezovich Hinal was an avid traveler, having lived in Colombia, migrating to the US after college, and having been to Europe and Austria on various trips. So what happened on February 3rd, 2024, when she texted her friends and family, it was never seen again. Her apartment in the Salamanca neighborhood of Madrid, Spain was empty, and Anna had essentially vanished. The case of Anna's disappearance has left the FBI and Spanish police department confused. When Anna's case became the center of international attention, everyone had theories of their own. Maybe Anna's disappearance was a targeted hit. Maybe it was a stranger who took advantage of a lone woman. But shortly after, mind-boggling evidence came out that left everyone stunned and speechless. And the investigators tracked the paper trail down to the one person Anna was closest to. If you're new here, welcome to True Crime Stories. I post new true crime cases every week, narrated by yours truly, a real human person, not some AI bot like these other channels that are so popular these days. So if you wanna see some good old fashioned true crime cases, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and it'll keep you up to date with all of my future videos. But Anna Maria Hanau was born in 1984 in Colombia. Her family consists of her parents and her younger brother, Juan Felipe Hanau. Even though not much is known about her childhood and upbringing, Anna's family and friends defined her as a headstrong, loving, and caring woman. Anna attended EA Fit University in Columbia, where she studied international business and business administration and management from the years of 2000 to 2005. She even earned certifications in quality management, project management, and human resource management. Once she graduated, she worked as an administrator and manufacturing manager, and then she joined Kodak Columbia in 2001 where she was appointed as the administrator of health equipment services. After working there for about four years in 2005, Anna made the decision to move to the US, which she felt was the best decision of her life. She settled in Florida, where she worked as a general manager for Alex Dominguez and Associates, a nonprofit mental health organization that worked for children with special needs, mainly focusing on autism. Anna worked in the nonprofit industry for about five years, from 2005 to 2010 and she loved every second of it. Anna was a smart and ambitious woman who craved challenges and worked around problems to find a solution. But Anna wasn't a workaholic by any means. She loved her quiet time just as much. She loved reading books, cooking, and reconnecting with nature. Her favorite outdoor activity was hiking. Sticking to her Colombian roots, Anna loved Colombian coffee, and she defined it as her fuel to keep going. Anna was also very helpful and charitable and her brother Juan is forever grateful for everything his sister had done for him. Anna was the type of person who loved seeing other people soar. She didn't just want herself to be successful, but she also wanted to share her insights and experiences with other people as well. Juan recalled a very touching moment involving Anna when she paid for his plane tickets and even got him a laptop when Juan was moving to England to do volunteer work in an organization for people with disabilities. Anna even encouraged Juan to go, saying that these were going to be the best years of his life. And it turned out she was right. Juan enjoyed doing volunteer work, and Anna, being the caring and generous person she was, even offered Juan a job at her company in Florida. Juan owed everything he had to his sister. Juan was thankful to have a caring sister like Anna who wanted to see him grow and become the best version of himself. He even stated, quote, it's basically all because of her. I always told her this, if it weren't for her, I don't know what I'd be doing. It's just so heartwarming to see that Anna and Juan had an amazing relationship, and Anna, with her nurturing and motherly nature, changed Juan's life for the better. Anna was also a diehard animal lover. She loved dogs, and she even had a puppy at the time of the case. By all accounts, she was a wonderful woman with a warm and genuine smile and a personality that made everyone want to hang out with her. But Anna, during her time as a general manager at the nonprofit health organization, met someone significant, and this person would change Anna's life in every sense of the word. Anna met David Knezovich, an IT specialist who originally came from Serbia, who moved to the US just like Anna. Not much is known about David, but what we do know is that David was a seasoned computer specialist. He studied computer science at the University of Educational Sciences in Belgrade, Serbia. David also worked for Telx as a senior engineer and data center virtualization architect. In 2010, he met Anna, 
and in 2011, the couple got married. And together in 2012, they established their own business called EOX Technology Solutions, located in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Anna and David were perfect for each other. Both were highly ambitious and were great leaders, and they eventually wanted to work in the field of IT and cybersecurity. Anna and David built their business from the ground up, and initially, it was David who was working in the company full-time before he persuaded Anna to join him, and the rest is history. In December of 2010, Anna was working as a project manager at EOX and helped many small business owners in all things IT. Anna and David seemed like the perfect power couple. Anna was the manager with the mindset of growing together while David was the quintessential cutthroat businessman. And together, they transformed their lifelong dream into a thriving business. They even had several properties, including two in Fort Lauderdale. Everything was perfect until it wasn't. See, even though Anna and David's professional life was great, their personal life was anything but. Anna and David's relationship fell apart, and after 13 years of marriage in 2023, the couple's marriage reached the end of the road. It wasn't just a rocky path, though. Anna and David were separated a few months prior to the events of the case, and they were considering divorce near the end of 2023. But what happened soon after, no one could have anticipated. Anna and David, while going through a divorce, were separated. Anna wanted a bit of a change in her life, so she decided to pack her bags and book a flight from Florida to Madrid, Spain. Anna was obviously an avid traveler, and she loved experiencing different cultures in different cities. So Spain was the perfect place for her to go to get her mind off of things. Anna went to Madrid on December 27th, 2023, rented an apartment on Francisco Silvela Street in the Salamanca Quarter, and was in contact with her family and friends back in the US. Anna's best friend, Sana Ramon, remembered that Anna was in love with Spain and its unique culture. She even remembered Anna expressing her wish to live in Madrid permanently. Sana and Anna were not only best friends, but they also traveled together. Anna went to meet Sana in Austria earlier in January, and Sana even had made plans to visit Anna in Madrid on February 8th. According to Sana, Anna was depressed because of the ongoing divorce proceedings, but she was seeing her therapist regularly and even was taking her medication to help with these depressive thoughts. Sana even expressed Anna's wish to work with a nonprofit organization in Spain for abused women after she was done with her split from her estranged husband, David. Anna even had plans to meet up with a friend on February 5th to go to a conference in Barcelona. Now, according to CCTV footage, Anna was seen walking back to her Madrid apartment that she'd rented at about 2.30 p.m. Later that night, Anna also called her friend, and she sounded very happy and excited for her trip to Barcelona on February 5th. Anna didn't sound sad, scared, or anxious. It was a very normal call, and everything seemed fine. But fast forward to February 3rd, and everything got weird. And Santa was the first one to sense that something wasn't right. Santa was minding her own business when she received two messages from Anna on WhatsApp. Santa was excited to hear from her friend, but as soon as she read the texts, she got a very uncomfortable and sinking feeling in her stomach. It seemed like the texts were from Anna, and they basically entailed that she'd met a wonderful man on the street and that he was taking her to his home, which was about two hours from Madrid, where cell phone service was going to be spotty. The second message explained how Anna met this wonderful man. And apparently, Anna, after a therapy session on February 2nd, went for a walk and bumped into the mystery man. The message also stated that the two clicked and that it was an instant connection, nothing like Anna had ever experienced before. Sana, upon reading these texts, immediately replied to Anna. She knew that something was wrong, and she pleaded with Anna to share her location or give her more information about the man. But Anna didn't respond to any of Sana's frantic texts. The reason why it was so bizarre for Anna to up and leave with a random man, who she had an instant connection with, was that firstly, she never mentioned meeting any man on the call with her friend earlier that same day. So the timeline mentioned in the texts didn't make any sense. Anna sounded happy and was looking forward to meeting her friend in Barcelona, and that was that. If Anna had met someone, surely she would have mentioned it to her close friend, who knew everything about her life. Secondly, Anna would never have ditched her friend for a random man she met in her Madrid neighborhood. Remember, Anna and her friend had plans to go to Barcelona just two days after Santa received those creepy and cryptic messages from Anna. This was very unlike her. Anna wasn't the impulsive or irresponsible type. 
So Anna ditching her plans with her friend sounded unbelievable to Santa. Thirdly, and this was also something that stood out to Santa the most, was the fact that the messages didn't sound like Anna at all. They felt very flat, unemotional, and lacked personality. Everyone has a specific text tone when they type. It's hard to explain, but everyone types and expresses their feelings and texts in a different way. And from what Santa was reading, she was certain that the texts weren't from Anna. But Santa wasn't the only one to receive weird messages from Anna. Her own brother, Juan, received a text from Anna in Spanish, and Juan also felt weirded out after reading the WhatsApp text. It was typed in Spanish, but again, this wasn't the way Anna spoke in her candid text conversations. The dialect was different, as if someone had written a message in English and then translated it with Google Translate. Anyway, Santa, understandably shaken up by the weird messages, decided to call Anna's friend in Madrid, and then the Spanish authorities. Two days passed, and February 5th rolled around, but Anna failed to show up to meet her friend for their Barcelona trip. This intensified the fear that Anna's friends were feeling, and on the same day, 40-year-old Anna Knezevich was officially reported missing to the police. The detectives started by searching Anna's apartment, and they found nothing that was out of the ordinary, aside from the fact that Anna wasn't there. There were no signs of a robbery, the house wasn't messy or turned over, and there was seemingly nothing suspicious about the apartment, although Anna's phone laptop and chargers were nowhere to be found. Now, we don't know whether the authorities did an extensive turn the place upside down search of Anna's apartment, or if they just looked around and took the condition of the apartment at face value. Some reports also state that the people conducting the search were firefighters, not proper investigators. So this could have played a role in clues being missed. Since the Spanish police department didn't release much information about the case, the details are still up in the air and quite vague. On February 7th, four days after Santa and Juan received those WhatsApp texts from Anna, Juan actually spoke to the investigators and revealed something very pivotal about Anna and her personal life. According to Juan, since Anna and David were in the midst of a very messy divorce, there was a lot of money on the line to be split between the two. Moreover, David, Anna's estranged husband, wasn't happy about the division of their assets. He felt that he was entitled to more than his fair share. There was something definitely wrong in Anna and David's relationship from the get-go. And even Anna's brother told the detectives that Anna and David, even though they were very affectionate towards each other, had problems in their marriage, and even tried several times to salvage their relationship. But things came to a fateful end in early 2023, when Anna tearfully confided in her family about her split and pending divorce with David. As the police were looking further into Anna's disappearance, some very bizarre things came forth. First, on February 2nd, the day Anna was last seen, CCTV cameras caught something very unsettling. See, on the same day, at around 9.27 p.m., surveillance cameras caught a man waiting outside the building where Anna was living. Now, this might have been something normal, if not for the next two details. The man was wearing a motorcycle helmet, but he didn't own a bike. If that wasn't alarming enough, the man wasn't able to enter the building, as he didn't have a key card, nor did he even live there. So he was waiting for people to come in or out so that he could slip in the front door behind them. But there were more odd things that took place. Not long after the man entered the building, still wearing the helmet, he proceeded to spray the surveillance cameras with black spray paint, disabling them. He even fumbled with the main entry of the building by fastening a piece of duct tape onto the lock to keep it from engaging. The man can be seen with most of his face covered but his eyebrows and eyes were visible as he spray painted every single surveillance camera that he saw. Afterwards, almost an hour passed by and around 10.30 p.m., the same man was seen getting off the elevator, but this time he was seen wheeling a suitcase. But this is where things get even more weird and confusing. See, Santa, after days of trying to contact Anna, reached out to none other than David, her soon-to-be ex-husband, and asked if he was willing to go to Madrid with her to look for his missing wife. To Santa's surprise, David had left Florida and he was currently back in Serbia. So if David was in Serbia, then who was the man in the helmet? And what was his motive? Did he really abduct or harm Anna? And moreover, if the man in the footage was David, like the detective suspected, then why did he lie to Santa in the first place? The police were left with more questions than ever. But one thing was for sure, David was now on their radar.
The most crucial task on hand for the investigators was to figure out who the man in the helmet was. When the footage of the man was cross-matched with the picture of David, there were a lot of similarities. The man's height matched David's height. The perpetrator's eyes and eyebrows also matched David's. The detectives were also able to track down the store from where a can of spray paint and a few rolls of duct tape were bought, and the person in the CCTV footage was none other than Anna's estranged husband, David. But wasn't he in Serbia at the time that Anna disappeared? Why was he in a store hundreds of miles from where he said he was supposed to be? Well, this revelation raised a lot of suspicion for the police, and they went ahead and tracked David's movements before Anna disappeared. It's alleged that David did go to Serbia, but not exactly. On January 27th, he flew from Miami to Istanbul, Turkey, and then finally to Serbia. Upon reaching Serbia, he rented a car on January 29th. The police contacted the rental car company in Serbia, and they confirmed that the vehicle was returned, but with a lot of mileage. 800 miles to be exact. Also, the windows had been tinted, and there were stolen license plates found. It's speculated that David used the car to travel to Spain, and on February 22nd, he was seen in a Madrid hardware store buying spray paint and duct tape with cash. The license plates that were stolen in Madrid were also checked by investigators' car readers, and they were spotted near a motorcycle shop where the same helmet the mysterious man was wearing was purchased, as well as on Francisco Silvella Street, the same street where Anna was renting her apartment. Horrifically, on the same night that she disappeared. What was even more alarming was the fact that after the suspicious man left Anna's apartment building with a suitcase, the same vehicle with the stolen license plate was seen on multiple Madrid toll booth cameras. The camera was unable to make out the driver since the windows were tinted, but it seemed that David was trying to be as discreet as possible by covering his tracks. But why was he doing this? Why would he go through all of these lengths? And why was he afraid of getting trailed? Furthermore, on February 3rd, David allegedly reached out to a Colombian woman he was talking to on a dating app, and he asked her out of the blue to translate some messages for him in, quote, perfect Colombian Spanish. David wasn't fluent in Spanish and only knew how to speak English, whereas Anna was bilingual, having fluency in both Spanish and English. The woman later reached out to the police, and when they showed her the messages that Anna had sent her friends and brother, the woman confirmed that those were the exact messages David had asked her to translate. Fast forward to April of 2024, an employee of David's reached out to the authorities with yet another odd occurrence. According to the employee, David had asked her to impersonate Anna to open a new bank account and he even went as far as giving the employee Anna's social security number. The employee eventually refused as she felt uncomfortable impersonating her boss's missing wife. Anna's disappearance is being led by the FBI along with the Spanish and Serbian detective departments. The main motive, according to police, is money. David and Anna owned properties worth millions of dollars, and since the couple was on the verge of a divorce, it meant that the money had to be divided equally. And since they were in Florida, Anna was due to receive 50% of the assets after divorce. This might have been something that David didn't appreciate, and he had no choice but to come up with such an elaborate and evil plan to allegedly kidnap his wife in another country. It's just so unnerving to see how David meticulously planned every step of his vile plan, all for money. On May 4th, with all of the evidence against David for his involvement in Anna's disappearance, he was arrested in Miami International Airport and charged with the kidnapping of 40-year-old Anna Hanau. He was transported to the Federal Detention Center in downtown Miami because, given his wealth and connections in other countries, he was a danger to the community as well as a flight risk. But get this, David had sold six Florida rental homes to a single buyer and that too a month before Anna disappeared. Three weeks after which, David sold another property to a different buyer. The sales totaled a whopping $6 million, and police were afraid that if David had access to this money, he could easily flee the country. After his arrest, David appeared in front of a court on June 10th of 2024 and pleaded not guilty to kidnapping his wife. His defense lawyer also went on to negate the claims made by the prosecution that David could flee the country. According to him, David has no access to money, and therefore he can't flee the country. The Hnau family, on the other hand, expressed their concerns about when Anna confided in them about her heated divorce with David. According to the prosecution, Anna was scared of David, since she fought his contention of receiving more than half of the assets. And this was the main reason why their divorce was getting tough and messy. 
David's defense, on the other hand, stressed that the separation was amicable and that the financial agreements were sorted out between the two. As of June 18th, 2024, a tentative trial date was set for July 23rd, but it was delayed later on. In August of 2024, David applied for bail, which was denied on the grounds that he was a flight risk. But that didn't stop him from applying a second time, but it was also denied as recently as September 10th. Judge Torres also overthrew the defense's attack on the prosecution, which apparently has no jurisdiction to charge David for kidnapping in Miami, as Anna disappeared in Spain. Judge Torres further added that there was ample evidence to support the kidnapping case on David. So what's next? Well, the disappearance of Anna Knezovich Hanau is still an ongoing case. Even though the main suspect, David Knezovich, and his husband is in police custody, there's still one very heartbreaking aspect of this case, and that's the fact that Anna, to this day, still hasn't been found. In August, firefighters flooded the heavily wooded areas of the province of Vicenza in Italy in hopes of finding Anna, although the results have not been fruitful. If Anna is still out there alive, then her family hasn't heard from her. Even though the Hanau family is clinging on to hope that Anna is still alive and well, the chances of that happening are realistically and sadly very low. To this day, Anna's phone, her missing belongings, as well as the mysterious suitcase haven't been recovered. It's alleged by the FBI that David, on the night of February 2nd, attacked Anna and transported her body in the suitcase and discarded it somewhere along with her phone and laptop. But this is just speculation, as neither David has confessed to anything yet, nor has the suitcase been discovered by anyone. It seems that the only people who know what went down on that fateful day of February 2nd are David and Anna, who's still missing. Statistically, if a missing person doesn't show up or contact their family within 72 hours, then it's highly likely that they are unfortunately deceased. And in Anna's case, whose disappearance was in a foreign country, the chances are even slimmer. Even so, the Hanau family, in a state of grief, are still hoping that Anna will get justice. Anna's brother Juan stated, quote, We trust the American authorities and the justice system. We trust that they're going to make justice for my sister. That's all that we want. Just the whole unraveling of evidence and events in Anna's case has been unfulfilling. As of now, seven months into the disappearance of Anna in Madrid, everyone is looking forward to David's trial, the exact date of which is still not known. We can only hope that, at the end of the trial, justice is served, and if David really is the mastermind behind this disgusting plan, that he has to face the consequences for his heinous actions. Normally, cases like this seem fairly open and shut, and I'll usually offer my opinion at the end, but in this case, I'm just not so sure. It seems glaringly obvious that David was almost certainly involved in Anna's disappearance, but the issue I'm personally having is that all of the evidence is pretty shaky. We don't have anything concrete. When you look at a case like this, you hope to see obvious CCTV footage, maybe DNA left behind, fingerprints or something. But instead, all we have is a theory that David is the man in the motorcycle helmet. A fragile witness statement that David was probably the guy who requested the translated text messages and a coworker who David asked to help him commit a felony. Now, let's be real. Anyone with half a brain knows that all of these things are highly suspicious, and it's almost certain that David was involved in Anna's disappearance. But when you bring these things up in the context of a court of law, I'm just not sure it'll be enough to lead to a conviction. I just hope that regardless of the outcome of this trial, that Anna's family can find the closure they're looking for. It would be even better if Anna were to be found alive somewhere, but we all know that the chances of this happening are incomprehensibly small. More than anything, I just hope that Anna's family finds the answers they're looking for. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Camille and True Crime 59. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you who've decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link down in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.